this faith and finance podcast is underwritten in part by Praxis Mutual Funds. They are a leading faith-based family of mutual funds helping people integrate their finances with their values since 1994. With Praxis, your investments can make a difference for you and the world around you. Learn more at PraxisMutualFunds.com. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Ephesians 6, 11. Hi, I'm Rob West. Do you sometimes feel you're spiritually at war with your own investments? How do you take on corporations that engage in ungodly policies and practices? Well, one way is through something called shareholder advocacy. And we'll talk with Chris Meyer about that today. Then it's on to your calls at 800-525-7000. That's 800-525-7000. This is Faith and Finance, biblical wisdom for your financial decisions. Well, it's always interesting and informative to have Chris Meyer on the program. He's manager of stewardship, investing, advocacy, and research at Praxis Mutual Funds, an underwriter of this program. And Chris, it's great to have you back with us. Thank you, Rob. It's nice to be here. Chris, before we get into the specifics of shareholder advocacy, uh, tell us what brought you to this field and the role faith played in the process. Sure. The the beginning of my journey to shareholder advocacy probably began when I was a teenager. My faith background is Mennonite, and through my faith, I had developed a strong sense of purpose. And this purpose became a desire to seek shalom, which I define as harmonious relationships between God, humans, and creation. And I really wanted to make a difference in the world to to work towards shalom. As I grew up, I came to believe that the greatest power for good or for bad seemed to rest in the financial world. And I felt called to make an impact through business or investments, although I wasn't really sure which path uh, I would take. I eventually learned about a career opportunity at Everance Financial, an agency partner of the Mennonite Church and the parent company of Praxis Mutual Funds. The role seemed to fit me well, and it was centered on making a difference through investments, specifically shareholder advocacy, and I found that practice quite intriguing. Plus, it was a faith-based organization that I was already familiar with, And I guess uh, here I am more than 15 years later. Yeah, that's a helpful backdrop to our conversation today. All right, well, let's dive into shareholder advocacy. Chris, what exactly is it and how do you all go about doing it there at Praxis? I'll I'll start by mentioning that there are many ways to make an impact through one's investments. Um, A lot of people start with screening or avoidance of certain industries or companies And that's certainly one way to take a principled stand and say, you know, I don't want to profit from this business activity, which is antithetical to my values. It's certainly a valid approach, and we we do it at Praxis. It also has uh, limited power to change things on the ground. There are additional ways that one can make an impact through their investments with that go beyond screening. At Praxis, we use seven different impact strategies to make a difference. Uh, One of them is screening, but another is shareholder advocacy, which is different in that it harnesses the power of ownership to create change. Shareholder advocacy makes use of the rights and privileges of owning stock. It can take many forms, such as writing letters and filing shareholder proposals, all the way up to dialogue with company management. And I'd say uh, to us, shareholder advocacy isn't about chastising or, or embarrassing companies. As investors, we want the companies we're invested in to be profitable you know, on behalf of our, our clients and shareholders. We also believe that they can do better to help the world thrive. And I want to mention that we're, we're not alone in this kind of work. Um, almost all the advocacy we do is in partnership with other investors, most of whom come from the faith community. Well, I love to hear that you're working in partnership with others. And Chris, are you seeing that this shareholder advocacy is really making a difference in the policies and practices of companies you're engaging with? Certainly. Um, I've been doing this for more than 15 years. And over that, that time period, I've been a part of a lot of different successes 
we were collaboratively able to uh, move things forward at, at companies um, and, and really make a difference. So yes, I've, I've been part of a number of different successes that I'm grateful for. Oh, that's exciting. Well, when we come back from this break, we'll continue to talk about shareholder advocacy. What does it look like to prepare for these engagements? What do they look like? And what change is actually taking place? Uh, we're talking today with Chris Meyer. He's manager of stewardship, investing advocacy, and research at Praxis Mutual Funds, an underwriter of this program. Much more to come just around the corner. Stick around. We are grateful for support from LightPoint Portfolios, which seeks out family and faith-friendly investments for 401k and 403b plans, integrating faith values and fiduciary duty. LightPoint Portfolios offers retirement plans for a variety of organizations such as businesses, nonprofits, and churches. And we're grateful for their sponsorship of the Faith and Finance Program. More information is available at lightpointportfolios.com. Absolutely free. We know you've learned to be suspicious of those words, but really, you can get biblical financial wisdom delivered to your inbox each week absolutely free. Articles, videos, podcasts, and special offers on biblical resources. Nearly 60,000 people receive our free weekly wisdom email, and you can too. Create your free FaithFi account by going to faithfi.com and click sign up to begin receiving weekly wisdom in your inbox. I'm so thankful to have you with us today on Faith and Finance. We're talking today about faith-based investing and specifically an aspect of it that is really powerful called shareholder advocacy. It's the opportunity you have as an owner of a stock or a particular company to engage with that company and let them know that, yes, you want them to be profitable, but you also care about their policies and their practices, and you want them to help the world thrive, not get involved in lots of political activities that don't have anything to do with their primary business. Well, we're talking today Today about shareholder advocacy and the opportunity you have. My guest today is Chris Meyer. He's the manager of stewardship, investing, advocacy, and research at Praxis Mutual Funds and underwriter of this program. And they're engaged in all kinds of shareholder advocacy. And Chris, before the break, you were saying that uh, you work in partnership in your advocacy efforts with many other investors, especially the faith community. So would you talk a bit more? about how you work with others and specifically what role does that play in the issues you pursue and even the success you're able to experience? Yeah, great, great questions. And I'll, I'll start by saying that when the reason we work with others um, is because when we do so, we dramatically increase both the breadth and the depth of what we can accomplish. Companies are also more likely to take us seriously when we join together in coalition and kind of approach them collectively. We partner with many other faith-based institutional investors, um, primarily. Uh, They might be pension funds, endowments, church agencies, or they may otherwise manage money on behalf of church members. And they represent many different denominations, and each of them have their own unique perspective and priorities. What we do is we collaborate uh, with others where we have common ground in interest and capacity. So both uh, interested in the same topics and have the ability to be able to do the work. Um, For instance, um, at Praxis, we we join with faith-based investors to engage companies on human rights and child labor issues. Mm. Others might prioritize advocacy with, say, pharmaceutical companies on the affordability of critical medications. We don't work on that issue, but we do appreciate their effort. So some investors work on issues that we don't and vice versa. And we lead on some of the engagements we pursue and we're active partners on others while others lead. And none of us can do everything. So issue and company prioritization are necessary. Yeah, that's really helpful. And it sounds like there's a lot of moving pieces here. So maybe take us behind the scenes for a moment. What kind of preparation goes into an engagement like you're describing? 
Yeah, it's a, a lot of preparation. Uh, so once we go through uh, prioritizing the issues we want to work on as uh, organization, as praxis, and then we collectively do that with others, we have a good idea of the topics and the companies that we plan to engage. So we, we tend to form teams with our investor partners and determine like our leadership structure, and we set goals for what we hope to accomplish. We organize like in-person and virtual education and strategy sessions to familiarize ourselves with the relevant information and be able to speak intelligently and I'd say with purpose when we engage companies. We often will bring in outside expertise to help us learn more. I'll, I'll give an example. So I'd mentioned that we work on human rights and child labor issues. Yeah. Uh, two companies that we engage are Target and, and Walmart. And it's not that Target and Walmart are bad. It's that they have a huge footprint in the retail sector and they have supply chains that stretch around the world. They have significant impact uh, both with what they do themselves and because their actions influence other retailers. There's a, kind of a ripple effect. So it kind of makes sense to prioritize some of those companies. And what we seek with them are uh, robust human rights policies that protect the most vulnerable people, which are then we want to see cascaded uh, down throughout the company's supply chains and enforced. Um, so prior to engaging them in dialogue, we're, we're sure to examine their latest publications and reports, and we keep informed about the latest news and trends in the industry. We will also, for instance, hear from human rights experts and NGOs about forced and child labor situations throughout global supply chains. And all of this preparation is, is necessary, I think, to, to gain an understanding of the issues and to be taken seriously by the company. Wow, that's powerful. I mean, I can really see what you were talking about in the earlier segment around why you went into this work related to just the real power through the capital markets of change that can be affected in really dealing with these uh, important issues of our time, uh, like slave labor and, and so many other issues. Now, Chris, if company dialogues are central to real change, uh, talk about what these engagements look like and what makes an effective conversation or dialogue with a company. Yeah, in, in my experience, getting to a point of meaningful dialogue with company management is kind of the, the pinnacle of shareholder advocacy as in it's the best way to make an impact when you have that kind of uh, meaningful dialogue. Uh, a new engagement with a company often begins with an investor letter outlining our concerns and requesting dialogue. And we might initially deal with uh, investor relations and maybe their corporate counsel, but hopefully we end up communicating with the most important people to the issue at hand. So we try and meet with the decision makers who oversee our area of concern. And typically that's vice presidents um, at that level and some of their staff. And usually one way or another, we, we get to the dialogue stage. Uh, our conversations are typically in person or via video conference, and they usually last uh, one or two hours. Uh, occasionally they can be longer. And over time, we look to establish strong, trusting relationships. Once companies understand that we have a vested interest in their future success um, and that we're also bringing forward relevant concerns that are pertinent to the company, the conversations can really reach a new level. Mm, yeah, that's helpful. So what is the end game, Chris? How do you know you've been successful in making meaningful change in support of kingdom values in these engagements? Yeah, I think uh, starting at the beginning, uh, having a sense of goals and uh, ways to measure success are, are key steps in the advocacy process. And it's important to envision what the end of a dialogue might look like. Uh, corporate engagements can often last many years, but can lose their meaning if they become routine and static with no clear end. I mean, we don't want to be disregarded by the company as you know some kind of nuisance. In, in that case, they might stall without making any real changes. And alternatively, I mean, sometimes this happens, like if the company greatly values our insight and seeks many more conversations and increasing amounts of time, we can become their free consultants, which we also don't want to do uh, <laughs> where we're investors. <laughs> yes. um, so there is a few common scenarios for, for ending a dialogue at the worst. And, you know, a company won't meet with us or clearly dismisses us. In that case, it's not really worth pursuing 
uh, dialogue, then we might cease investment with the company. In the best case scenario, all our goals are met or exceeded, and we kind of move to a, a, a more of just a monitoring process for a for a time just to make sure they're following through on their commitments. Well, Chris, that is incredible. I love the work that you're doing, and I'm delighted you got a chance to shed some light on it today. Thanks for stopping by. We appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me on the show. That was Chris Meyer, Praxis Mutual Funds. You can learn more at PraxisMutualFunds.com. That's Praxis, P-R-A-X-I-S, MutualFunds.com. Your calls are next, 800-525-7000. That's 800-525-7000. This is Faith and Finance. We'll be right back. We are grateful for support from Praxis Mutual Funds. Praxis Mutual Funds has seven impact strategies that are designed to create positive real-world change. More information is available at PraxisMutualFunds.com. The fund's investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses are contained in the prospectus and summary prospectus. This and other information is available at PraxisMutualFunds.com. Investments involve risk. Principal loss is possible. Foresight Fund Services, LLC. As the leading advocate for the Christian financial industry, Kingdom Advisors serves the public by promoting the integration of a biblical worldview across every aspect of the financial services industry. And we serve a growing network of thousands of Christian financial professionals, equipping and empowering them to carry biblical financial wisdom to their clients, peers, and community. For more information, visit KingdomAdvisors.com. That's KingdomAdvisors.com. You're listening to Faith and Finance, where we talk about how we handle God's resources. How are you using God's resources? We're talking about it, and the lines are open to take your calls and questions. 800-525-7000 is the number to call. Uh, let's begin today in Tennessee. Hi, Kathy. Thanks so much for calling. How can we help? Hello, and thank you so much for your program. It has carried me for many, many years. Well, thank you. And now you. that That's I'm in kind. my senior years, I am... Um, having seen your questions. <laughs> okay, I'm happy to help. Okay, I uh, recently had, had an attorney uh, look at estate planning, and of course we we are very limited in what I would call a, an estate. We just, the only money we really have is what is in our home. Um, so I went to her to ask questions, and she recommended that I also look into a Medicaid program of some kind, and it's because she said with your limited income, you may need that in in your latter years. And But she also was telling me that it would be around $3,000, and I, I don't have $3,000 at this point. I'm wondering if there's another way to go about um, looking into that without spending a whole lot of money. Yeah. So what was it she was going to do for $3,000? Well, she was going to do um, uh, the the Medicaid paperwork, and then she was going to do. I honestly can't remember. There was maybe it had to do with powers of attorney, um, and uh, I, I really can't remember the third one. But there were three different items, and so coupled into to, all put together, it would be. She even said thirty five hundred with those additional things. Okay. Yeah, I might get a second opinion on that. I mean, at first I thought maybe she was talking about uh, the Medicaid asset limit. Um, So, you know, right now there are limits on how much you can have uh, in terms of assets to qualify for uh, Medicaid. Um, but it sounds like, you know, what you're saying here is that the total cost of putting all these documents together was 3,500 and without her putting a trust in the mix, um, you know, for those other documents, that seems a little high. I mean, I, I always hesitate to question fees just because I think professionals are very, um, you know, they're worth paying for. And, you know, you want to have somebody who has skills and can make sure that you're not only putting the right documents in place, but also that you've, you know, they're in line with the laws of your state and somebody who can ask you the right questions to make sure that, uh, you know, all of your wishes are being taken, you know, care of. 
Um, and certainly you want to be able to pay somebody what they're worth for their time. Uh, at the same time, you know, there are some kind of industry standards and I would think you getting a, a will plus, you know, a durable power of attorney, maybe a healthcare surrogate and a living will. Uh, I wouldn't expect that to be up in the 33,000 plus range unless there was a trust involved. So what you may want to do, Kathy, is just get a second or third opinion. If you don't have somebody else to check with, you could contact a certified kingdom advisor in your area and ask for a referral to a godly um, estate planning attorney who could just weigh in on the situation. You can tell them basically what you're looking for, and they could quote you you know, a fee for that. Okay. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate the fact that it's, I didn't have to have the answer of, oh, that's ridiculous. You need to go away and do something else. But, but I do trust this person, and I just wanted to make sure we, I was in the right um, pathway. Yeah. And and I think that's a big part of this. You want to make sure you have somebody you have a good rapport with and high trust. And again, I wouldn't be the first to say, um, you know, that this is out of line. Uh, So what I would just say is whenever you're looking to uh, have something done that involves fees like this one, it's never a bad idea to get a couple of, uh, you know, offers or bids for somebody. Um, But at the end of the day, you may find that this is perfectly customary and appropriate it given what you're looking to have done. So I would just probably get a, a another opinion or two. And if they're somewhat in line with one another, then obviously, if this person, you know, is somebody that you know and trust, I would say, you know, I would probably lean in the direction of this individual that you've already spoken to. So I hope that helps you, Kathy. Thanks for your kind remarks about the program. I'm glad to hear you're getting your estate in order. And if we can help with anything else along the way, don't hesitate to reach out. May the Lord bless you. To Nebraska. Hi, Chris. Go right ahead. Hi. You had me about a year ago. I was low income, wanted to know if I could retire at 50, and you gave me great advice. I wanted to thank great. you for that. Now thank I'm you. thinking of my eight. Oh, no. Thank you. And I'm thinking of my eight year old nephew. I don't want him to struggle like I did through life. And is there something I can get started for him that his parents couldn't dip into where it'd give him a little at 20? a little more at 30 and a big chunk at 40 and the rest at 50. And then a second part of the question, do you have a website or anything that has books that helps kids with learning about finances? And I just wanted to thank you again in advance. Oh, that's very kind, Chris. Thank you for that. Uh, When we're done here uh, today on this question, you stay on the line. I'm going to ask Amy to get your information and we're going to send you a book called The ABCs of Managing Money God's Way from Howard Dayton. It'll be our gift to you. And um, beyond that, uh, you know, really what you're describing is a trust. And essentially, you would have to create a trust, uh, which an estate planning attorney would do for you. Um, You are the grantor. You establish the trust. It's a revocable trust, so it can be changed at any time. And then you would name a trustee, which can be an individual or a corporate trustee, but typically it would be an individual, somebody who's trustworthy and attentive to details and that could, you know, be named as um, the person that handles the trust upon your death or incapacitation. And then whatever gets, uh, goes into the trust, you would fund the trust over time with either cash or other assets. Um, You could uh, spell out in the trust documents how the money is to be distributed to the uh, beneficiary, in this case would be the child. But you could place certain restrictions on that in that a certain percentage would happen at, you know, at a X age and then Y age and then and so forth. And and all of that could be handled. Uh, you wouldn't be able to do that with just a typical account outside of a trust. That would give you the ability to allow the money to be dispersed over time. And it would name the individual who would have to make that happen. Is that what you're looking for? Yes, I wrote down everything you said. Thank you so much. Okay. You're welcome. So what I would do is contact an estate planning attorney in your area. If you don't know one, you could reach out to one of our certified kingdom advisors at faithfi.com. That's faithfi.com. Just click find a CKA. They could make a referral to you. And, uh, and then I would go visit with that person, let them know what you're looking to do, and then they could set it up for you. Uh, was there a second part to the question? No, but I just wanted to say thank you for helping us out here in this hard world. <laughs> well, you're so kind and I appreciate your generous heart and 
for your kind remarks today. Thanks for calling, and uh, we'll look forward to having you back sometime in the future. God bless you. Well, that does it for us today. I'm Rob West. Thanks to our amazing production team and to you for listening. I hope you'll join us again next time right here on Faith and Finance. Faith and Finance is provided by FaithFi and listeners like you.